morning, welcome. Y'all gonna get up and stand with us and worship this morning. We're gonna sing of how good, good her father is, amen? Who you are, I'm loved by you. It's who I am. 
Thank you. Have a seat. I'm glad to. Uh, glad you're here this morning. Aren't you glad we serve a good, good Father? Uh, he has not turned his eyes away from us this whole time, and uh, and I'm glad you're here. So if this is your first Sunday back, uh, you notice things are a little different. Um, but you know, basically, we're still going to love on each other, just at a distance. Uh, you know, we said last week, if you feel comfortable going up and hugging somebody and that person feels comfortable hugging you, that's on y'all, all all right? So y'all good with that. Uh, if you don't, just put your hand up and say, hey, stay away from me. Um, but we know that, that we have a, uh, uh, it is real, um, but as a church, it's time that we came back and began to fellowship with one another and love on one another and support one another and pray for each other. So, uh, again, and we want to thank, real quick, I didn't get a chance to really thank a lot of people last week. This, the past eight weeks before this, um, there are some people that stepped up. Uh, in this uh, in this church that made us able to do what we did and one is sitting right back there behind and Miss Val wave at everybody Miss Val she, her Valerie. Tara Tarvin Tara's not Tara's not here but you can look at her husband Gary back there he's he's, he's representing her stepped up um, Sunday school teachers Casey where's Casey Simmons is Casey in here there he is Casey Mark Where's um, Don and Don, all the Sunday school teachers that continue to teach, even when we didn't have, they had to go step outside the box and think outside the box. And it just was amazing to see. Uh, however, our deacons, our deacons, we're, if you're a deacon, raise your hand real quick. Raise your hand if you're a deacon. Don't be shy. Those guys taking on a family ministry, you've been contacted by them. They've continued throughout the, uh, the weeks to contact you. And I just want to, we couldn't have done this without everybody's help. And so I just... Last week, I failed to, to thank everybody, um, but I just want to let you know how much I appreciate it and everything you guys have done and what you continue to do. So, all right, we're, we're excited. We're about to get started with our worship. I want to really quick take a second just to recognize it is Memorial Day weekend, and I know a lot of times that means a uh, long weekend, going to the lake, maybe going camping, uh, barbecue, and all those things, but it's more than just a three-day weekend, all right? It's more than just a sale. Uh, And some people get confused what Memorial Day is. Memorial Day is when we remember those who gave their life for our country. Uh, We're remembering those who who gave and sacrificed their life for our country so that we can meet right here today. All right, if they hadn't fought in those battles, we wouldn't be sitting here today and enjoying the freedom of, of, of speech and the freedom of religion. And so we want to take time just to, to, to thank those whose, whose family. There's probably maybe somebody. Does anybody here have a family member that died in a war? We got one, a couple. All right. Those families, those families that sacrificed uh, the loss of a loved one uh, that fought for our freedom. So I just want you to remember this weekend. Have a good time. Enjoy your ribs. But remember what this weekend's really about. It's remembering those who laid down their life so that you and I could go eat ribs, so that you and I could go to the lake, so you and I could come to church. Remember that. So I just want to take that minute just to, to remind you of what Memorial Day is all about and, uh, and ask that you remember that as you have that time with your family and fun this weekend. All right, uh, Wednesday night, you got a real special treat. Last Wednesday night, we had Jim Curtis was, uh, brought the message. And uh, usually are like 12 to 18 minutes long. Look, we understand that your attention span is like mine like a little score. We don't have a very long extension span. So we're not doing big long lessons on Wednesday night, but I would encourage you to go ahead and check it out on Wednesday nights. We'll post the videos. They're on uh, the YouTube. They're also uh, on our little group me messages. So please go and check that out. Jim did a great job last this week. Mark Lee's going to handle it. So uh, tune in and listen to that. I promise you'll get a blessing out of it. All right, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have a time of new fellowship. <clears throat> All right, so... Uh, again, you know, it might be you just turn around and you holler at somebody on the other side of the room. Hey, I ain't seen you in a while. That's fine. Wave. Distance handshake. Like I said, if you're good with it, you can hug somebody. I'm not the social distancing police, okay? Uh, so we don't have an air horn that goes off when you get too close. That's on you. It's called personal responsibility. All right? All right. So let me pray, and then we'll have a time. Father, we do thank you for your love, and we thank you that you are a good, good father. And we thank you that even with this world right now seems crazy, you're still in control. And so, Father, we just uh, ask that you would be with us during this time. Our service, we thank you for our praise team. God, we ask that you just uh, anoint them as they begin to just lead us in worship. And, Father, we ask that you be with the message that, Father, that you would touch hearts when your word is, 
uh, is, is read, Father, that it would pierce hearts and change lives. Father, our desire today is to leave here more like your son, Jesus. So God, just use, uh, use this service today. Father, we thank you for those that have served in our country. We thank you for those that paid the ultimate price by laying down their life for our freedoms. And Father, we ask not only that you, uh, that you bless their families, but Father, we'd also remember them uh, in this weekend. God, we thank you. We're expecting awesome things because we serve an awesome God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, do a little uh, social distancing fellowshipping. Or not social distancing fellowshipping, whichever. Hey, everybody. Hey. Mark. Hey, everybody. Steve. How you doing? Brenda? Sharon? Ricky? Michelle? I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God And all my life you have been fed of God I love your voice You will lead me through the fire Even in darkest night You will close like no other I know you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived 
Father God. We've come here, Father God, just to serve you and to love you, Father God. Lord, I ask you to be with our pastor, Father God, as he brings a word this morning, Father God. Let him be your mouthpiece, Father. Lord, open up our hearts, Father God, to what you want for us. In your name I pray, amen. Amen. All right. me down just a touch in the house. Hold on, guys. I'm on. Hello, hello. I am coming out of those speakers, Blake. A little technical issue here we're going to fix. All right. This morning, we're starting a, uh, like a little two-week sermon series on family vacation. And uh, our family's going to be on vacation here in a few weeks. And uh, maybe you've got one planned um, in the next few weeks. Or maybe you've just come back from one. But I want to um, talk this morning about family vacations and, and hopefully tie it into some scripture for you. So I'm going to be in Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9. If you want to go ahead and turn there, Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9 is where we're going to be. You're familiar with this. With this. I know you've heard it before. Uh, but like I said, over the, the next few months, you're probably going to go on a little family getaway. And uh, you're going to be putting your family on display for so, all sorts of strangers. Have you ever thought of that way? That when you go on vacation, you're putting your family on display for everybody to see. Uh, it's a new environment. Your kids are probably crazy. It can be a little scary, matter of fact, to think that you're going to put your family on display. Because we've all seen that family that's on vacation where the dad and the mom have just quit. They're stopped trying anymore. I mean, you're in the restaurant and the kids are going wild and you look at the parents and they're just like, I'm done. Or right, they're going crazy at the, at the water park and, and the parents are like, I've done all I can do. I'm finished. So uh, you really are, you're kind of putting your family on display as you take them out on vacation because they're strangers that have never seen you before and all of a sudden that's the first impression they get of you is, look at that mother, look at that dad, look at those kids. And so family vacations can be fun. They can be a lot of fun, but they can also not be fun. I don't know if you've ever had a vacation where it wasn't fun. Has anybody ever had a family vacation that just didn't turn out the way you thought? All right, and you're ready to get home quick. It's happened to us uh, as the lackeys before too. Uh, can I share one with you this morning? And I'm gonna, uh, I'm not picking on anybody, but I just wanna share a true story. Uh, we went on vacation with Mr. Mark Lee and, and Heather and the Lee family. By that time, it wasn't, um, the twins weren't even thought of it then, I don't think. It was just a little blare there. We go on vacation, and uh, we went to the beach, stayed at a beach house, and uh, we went out, and if you've heard this story before, act like you haven't, um, and so we go out, and we're on the beach there, and it's uh, Heather and Dana and me, and we're sitting there, and Mark's beside us, and Mark decides, hey, it's hot, I'm going to get in the water, and he goes out and gets in the water, and so we're just kind of talking, and, uh, and we're like, at some point, we look and go, man, Mark's way out there in the water, <laughs> jeez, he's way out there, look, he's waving at us, and you know, hey, what, Mark? And, um, you know, we keep on talking, and he's still waving. We're like, all right, we see you. Yeah, you're on the sandbar. Nah, glad you're out there. He, we just kept on talking, didn't pay any attention. We was watching Anna and Blair were playing out in the water, and I don't know, it seemed like 30 minutes later, here, Mark's sitting beside us again, he's <sighs> like, what's, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? I was caught in a riptide, and I was trying to get you all to save me. So we couldn't distinguish whether this, we thought this meant, hey, guys, look at me. And it was, hey, guys, I'm dying. Help me. A few minutes later, a man and, a, and, a, and his uh, son come in. They started doing CPR on the man. I mean, it was a big deal. And, uh, and, and so it kind of put a little, little dent in our vacation. I mean, you know, Mark almost dies, and we almost watch a man die. Kind of made that vacation a little different. Well, you know, the truth is that a lot of times... Um, vacations can be good, they can be bad, but they always make memories. Would you agree with that? They always make memories. You probably can remember about every family vacation you went on because it makes memories. And you know, the thing about, uh, about memories are they're powerful and they can actually help shape our lives. They can teach us what to do, what not to do. Mark's situation, all right, we want to swim again, uh, parallel to the shore, rip tides get you, or wear a life jacket. One of the two, all right? All right, and if somebody's out in the ocean doing this, it probably doesn't mean they're waving at you. They're asking for help, all right? So, so we learned some lessons from that, but the truth is with these memories in your life, it can teach us what to do and what not to do. And it's the same thing, not just family vacations, but even 
in the middle of life, in, in regular life, the way we respond, what we say, what we do, makes memories for our kids. So this family vacation sermon series we're on is trying to help us be better parents, help us be better dads specifically, better moms specifically, and how to be children that God wants us to be. And so let's jump right into the scripture. If you will, will you stand with me as I read Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 9? Actually, I'm going to do 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the, uh, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. And tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Father, this morning we ask that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word. And Father, that this scripture would be more than just something we've heard and uh, a tradition that we might follow, but Father, this would hit home today and it would change us. And Father, we would understand this is important and we're to listen up as you speak. It's in your name we pray, amen. So first of all, let's understand uh, that this is Moses writing to the Israelites. And so what's happening is they're about to go into the promised land and Moses needs to tell them some stuff. And so he, he, this phrase he uses here, it says, um, hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now what, that, what basically Moses is saying is listen up, this is important. Put your phones down if they had phones back then. This is important. You need to be listening on this. And so he's got a very important message he's sending. Matter of fact, the Jewish people today, that's one of the first phrases that they teach their children is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is the Lord is one. It's a very important statement. All right? it, it, what it's saying is listen up. It's important. What I've got to tell you makes, makes a difference. And so he starts out with that. And why was it so important? Because as they went into the, the new promised land, the only way they were going to survive and thrive is that the family unit becomes the primary place where faith and love for the Lord is modeled. They didn't have necessarily, they didn't have churches back then. So who was modeling for the kids what it looked like to be a follower of Jesus? It was the parents. It was the parents' responsibility to walk it, to talk it in front of the kids. And he knew that if they were going to survive and thrive, it was going to take the parents understanding what needed to happen for their children to follow along. And so the same thing goes for us today is that as parents, regardless of what age you are. Now, some people might check out and go, well, I, my kids are already grown. You're still a parent. All right, still, still have an influence in your family. You might think, oh, well, they're 40, 50 years old. I don't, you still have an influence in their life. Well, you, you might think, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a parent yet. I'm sitting here. One day, hopefully, you are. So get ready for when you're going to be there. Be, be, have a plan together for when that time happens. And so Moses was telling him, this is very important. You've got to pay attention. The only way that we're going to get, uh, that kids are going to learn their faith and their love for the Lord is going to be modeled through their parents to their children. And it's the same thing is true today. The same thing is true today. Listen, it is the, the way most children are led to Christ by the example of their parents. It's still true today. And so I encourage you that today you listen to what's being said as Moses is, is sharing them. And, and he gives them um, he gives them four things. He says, this is what needs to happen. This is what needs to happen. If, if we're going to, to transfer our faith to our kids, this has to happen. And the first one he says is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. Now let's stop there and let's make sure we understand that love is a choice. If it wasn't a choice, God wouldn't say do it. So it's not a feeling all right, it's a choice. We choose to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And so that's a choice you can make. That's a choice your, your spouse can make is that we love the Lord our God. Well, what does that mean? It simply means this, making him the most important thing in your life. We can choose to do that. Now, how do we? Well, we have to, we have to dethrone some stuff because in our life right now, there might be things that are competing for the throne. All right, Jesus is, should be sitting on the throne of our life. 
But what competes with that? Well, money competes with that. Status competes with that. Um, you know, uh, things that we own compete with that. Our careers compete. Listen, we need to dethrone everything in our life that, that, that we hold more important than Jesus and place him where he's supposed to be. And so that's what it's saying is that we're to love the Lord our God with everything we have. Now, so the other things wrong? No, as long as Jesus is still over your life. Why does that make a difference? Because when Jesus is Lord over your life, your perspective changes on all those other things. If Jesus is Lord over your life, sitting in the throne of your life, I'm not worried about you and your job. I'm not worried about you and the things you own. I'm not worried about you because if Jesus is, is the king of your life, he's going to make sure all this is in the sp- place it's supposed to be. So we got to make him the Lord of our life. We got to give him everything. He's got to be, with, we got to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And that's a choice we make. Nothing in here talks about feelings, it's a choice we make. And when we love him like this, he becomes more important than anything else. And I'll just be honest with you, that's what he expects from us. That's what he expects out of us. He expects us to love him that way. That's what, that's, if you want to know what God's expectations are for you, to love him with all of your heart, to love him with all of your soul, to love him with everything you got. That's what he expects. So Moses tells them, hey, first thing you got to do, mom and dad, is you got to get this right. Right, you got to love the Lord your God. With, so if you're sitting in here today and you're a parent or want to be a parent, um, you need to first thing get this right. You need to learn to love. You need to choose to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your strength. All your, you need to make Him the most important thing in your life. If there's anything else right now that's more important than Him, you need to get rid of it. Put it in its right place. Now, how do I know? How, how can you t- take a little test on that? What is it that if I said you need to give this up, besides your relationship with Jesus? If I said, you need to give that up for the Lord, you would be like, not going to happen. If you got that in your mind, that's what you have above the Lord. That's what means more to you than, than Jesus. So that's a little test for all of us that we can take. Is this, is this more important than Jesus? If Jesus told me to give this up, would I do it? If you wouldn't, then you love it more than Jesus. And so the first thing we got to do is get that right in our life. And love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, um, and our strength. The second thing he says is, is we are to teach our children God's word. We're to teach them God's word. Listen, it says, these commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts, and then you're to impress them on your children. So first of all, you need to know the, 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 the word of God, but you need to teach it to your kids as well. Now, it's not the school's responsibility to do that, and I'll be honest, it's not even the church's responsibility to do that by itself. We're helpers. We come alongside. Mom and daddy, it's our jobs to do that. Because the best discipleship is modeled in the home. Listen, you're with your kids more than anybody else. You, you, have, a, uh, you have earned the respect of your kids. You, your kids look to you. And so you have the responsibility. We're commanded to teach our, children's, our children uh, the ways of the Lord. There's no one that spends more time with your kids. There's no one on earth that loves your kids more than you. And so you've been given the opportunity and you've earned their trust to be able to share the gospel with them. Can I ask you a question? Who in here, and I'm not trying to embarrass anybody or call you out, who in here has been able to lead their child? You have led your child to Christ or one of your children to Christ. Some, same. I mean, what an awesome, incredible opportunity to be the one to lead Jesus. Now, it might be that you taught them, brought them to church, and actually the pastor delivered the message that led them, but you played a part. You played a part, and it's important. It's important uh, that we teach our kids because you've earned the right. You've earned their trust. They look to you. Use that opportunity to teach them about Jesus. You know, don't lie to your kids or break promises. That's something that a lot of times we forget with your kids. They're looking to you, and even as a young, young age. How can we make sure that, that when we sow these seeds about Jesus that they stick, that they stay, that they're watered, that, they're, that they grow? Well, one is we cannot lie to our kids. Don't break promises without explanation. explanation. And what I mean by that is, listen, if, you, if they think you don't tell the truth, it's going to hurt their faith in Jesus. It's important that you make sure that you're a truth teller to your kids. Because one, if you're not telling the truth, one day you might be able to share Jesus with them and they begin to question, is that the truth? 
or is it not the truth? It's very important that, that we don't break promises, say we're going to do something and we don't follow through with it. Again, that can hurt their faith as they grow older, their faith in Christ, their faith in God. So we need to make sure that we need to teach our kids God's word, that we teach our kids God's word, not just bring them to church. That's not good enough. It's good, but not good enough. We have to teach them the word of God. We have to sow into them. And, and in doing that, we got to make sure that we're truth tellers and that we're promise keepers. That we, what we say we do, we do. And if something happens and we can't, we explain it to them. Listen, a lot of times in our mind, or at least in my mind, I can um, forget to tell people what's going on. I've already figured it out in my mind. I know what's going to happen, and I forget to communicate that with other people. Is anybody else like that? I bet husbands are all like that. All right, because I know, we, hey, we just forget. We get so, hey, we've got the problem figured out. I don't need to tell you about it. I got it done. And my wife's like, I need to know what's happening. Well, sometimes when we look at our kids, and, and we don't go on a vacation, we say we're going to go on, or we don't do this, and they're all hyped up about it, and we don't sit down and explain what happens, and all they look at is, he broke, my, he broke a promise. They broke a promise. You know, and what your kids look at, when they look at you, they're looking at what they see as God, as Jesus. I mean, you're, you, play that, you play the role in the, in the family of being that godly example. And so a lot of times, what they see in you is what they expect from God. So it's important that, that look, you're going to mess up. Don't get me wrong. You're human. We're human. We're going to mess up. But one way is to don't tell stories. Be truth tellers. And not only that, be promise keepers. And if you can't keep a promise, sit them down and tell them that you can. But it's so important that we teach God's word. And Moses says, that's one thing. Listen, as you go into this new, new time, this new land, make sure that you love God with everything you have. Make sure you teach the children God's word. Third thing he says, we're to live out our faith in front of our children. We're to live it out daily in front of our children. It says, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Basically, most saying, when everyday things, you need to be talking about Jesus. Everyday things, we need to be talking about. The Lord. It, they need, it needs to be modeled in the way you walk, in the way you talk, in the way you correspond with others. It needs, we have got to model it for our children. There was a group called uh, uh, Philip Craig's and Dean. I don't know if you've heard of them before, but they had a song back in the 90s that was called I Want to Be Just Like You, and it was one of the top hits. The man originally wrote that song uh, had polio as a child, and he began to uh, walk with a limp as an adult. And he found the inspiration for that song one day while he was mowing his grass with a push mower. And he looked behind him, and he saw his little boy with a toy mower, and he was limping just like his dad. And he wrote that song, I want to be just like you. The truth is that our kids watch us. Our kids watch the way we model out our life. A life of faith and our love for the Lord has got to be modeled in our home by mom and by dad. Because that's where the kids are going to learn the most. If you're one person in public and another person at home, that's confusing to a kid. That's confusing to a kid. Mom and daddy's this way at home, but mom and daddy's this way when they see other people? It's confusing. And so it's important that we model out our faith for the kids. Every day we're living out what, what a Christian is supposed to look like. When they look at us and they know, hey, mom and daddy go to church, mom and daddy love Jesus, then as you live that out every day, that's what they're thinking Christians are supposed to live like. So you're modeling it for them. So we want to make sure that we do uh, model it correctly. So if, if, we, uh, if they see us cheat or they see us steal or take advantage of other people, or what if they see us not loving our neighbors, then what we're telling our kids is, hey, that's what a Christian is supposed to act like. That's how a Christian acts. And down the road, that can hurt them. And so it's important that we live it out, that we model out. Now again, listen. We're humans. And there are times that we're going to fail. But not only when we fail is it important to ask God to forgive us, but listen to this. We should ask our children to forgive us. We should explain it to our children and ask them to forgive us. Well, I ain't got to explain nothing to my kid. Listen, it's their faith is important. You, you need to let them know when you've messed up. 
That's not an easy thing to do. I mean, like Austin Anna, I shouldn't have thrown that level across the yard the other night, okay, when I got mad. That was not a Christian thing to do. <laughs> I truly did throw a level. That was not my best moment. So four-foot level in the trash. Um, but the truth is this. When we do mess up and you sit your child down and you say, look, daddy wasn't supposed to act that way. That's not what Jesus wants me to, that's not the way Jesus wants me to act. Listen, that's, God's not happy with the way mama just handled that situation. And I'm sorry and I was wrong. You would be amazed at how that changes your relationship with your child. Because they see, one, they see that mom and daddy do mess up. But they also see that mom and daddy, it hurts them when God's not happy with them. It makes a difference. And so it's important that we model out our lives, our Christian walk in front of our kids. We don't get days off. You know, we don't, we don't get up. We are modeling Jesus every day. Now, when you mess up, you just sit them down and say, listen, mom and daddy messed up. I shouldn't have said that to that lady at Jack's. I shouldn't have said that to that lady at Walmart. I should not have ran over that lady at Walmart with that buggy. That was not very Christian-like. Daddy should not have tackled that guy that tried to take his parking place. Be honest with your kids and say, listen, I was wrong. I was wrong. I messed up. So he tells us to love the Lord your God with everything we have. We're to teach our children God's word. We're to model our faith out in front of them. And the fourth thing is here, as he says, we're to remind ourselves of the commitment that we've made to the Lord. Remind ourselves. So listen to verse 8. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on your door frames of your homes and your gates. Under each chair, I've placed a Sharpie. I'd like for you to take that out and write on your forehead. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. But back in the day, what they would do is they would have these little, these little boxes, and they would write down this scripture, and they would put it inside the box, and they would put it on their forehead. It would be like a headband they wore around their forehead. And it was for a purpose. It was a purpose behind it, to remind them of the commitment they had made, to remind them of who they serve, to remind them of the decision they had. And so uh, it's important that you and I remind ourselves of the commitment that we made. Now, we do this every day in our life. If you're married, you practice this every day. It's called a wedding ring. What's that wedding ring for? It's not magical. If I take this thing off, ooh, a little tighter than I thought it was. If I take this thing off, I'm still married. Okay? What a wedding ring is is a symbol of a commitment that you've made. It's designed so that when you see it, you make good choices. When you see it, you're reminded of the commitment you've made to your spouse to remain faithful. To place them first. And so we practice this every day. Maybe some of you are wearing a, a gold um, or a, a silver cross. Maybe you've got a, a, a necklace you wear that's a cross. Or maybe you've got a, a, a bracelet that you wear that you know, used to be WWJD was popular. Now there's all kinds of different ones. That you might wear a bracelet. Well, those just aren't for, you know, to uh, accessorize. Those should come with a meaning. Those things should remind you of the commitment. If you're wearing a WWJD bracelet uh, back in the day, what does that mean? What would Jesus do? It's supposed to remind you it was designed for you to look when a situation and go, oh, what would Jesus do? I made a commitment to be like Jesus. What would Jesus do? And so it's a reminder and, and reminding us of the commitment that we made. Crosses were designed to wear around your neck so that when you looked in the mirror, you would see that or others would see that. They would recognize you're a follower of Jesus and it would remind you of the commitment that you've made. Much more than just a pretty cross that you hung around your neck. You got a cross at your house. It's more than a decoration. It should be a reminder of what Jesus did for you and the commitment you made to him. The commitment he made to you and the one you returned made to him as a follower of Jesus. And so Moses is saying, listen, you take these things, remind yourself as often as you can. Uh, you know, write them on your door frames. I know Laramie and Lauren are just building a house and they've written scripture all through their house. Uh, on the, the stud walls. Maybe in your home, you, you need to throw some scripture up on the wall. 
There needs to be some plaques on the wall reminding you of the commitment. If you struggle at home to live out Jesus, maybe you need some reminders hanging up in your house. And I'm not here to, you know, to advertise for Hobby Lobby or anything like that. Listen, I don't care what you put, but I'm just saying if you put some things on your wall, remind yourself often. Maybe you need to tape a scripture to, to, your, uh, to your steering wheel that reminds you as you drive back and forth and people cut you off, the commitment you've made. Maybe it's on your mirror in the morning to remind you of how the day's supposed to start and what you're supposed to do. Maybe it's somewhere, that the last thing you see at night to remind you. But Moses said, reminder's important. It's important we need to remember the commitment we've made. And so to be good parents, the parents God called us to be, is we've got to love the Lord our God with all our heart. We've got to teach our kids God's word. Don't depend on the church to do it. We're to live out our faith in front of our children. It's not just a, uh, you know, it, it's a daily letting them see it in our walk, letting them see it everywhere we go. We're to remind ourselves of a commitment that we made to the Lord. And not only that, remind them. When they make that decision to follow Jesus, maybe that's something you do is give them something to remind them of the commitment that they've made. But going back to family vacations, they create memories. We admit, we admitted that most of our we can remember most of our family vacations, but so do Christian lives being lived out loud by their by the parents. So do lives by Christian parents being lived out loud that creates memories. My life, I can remember times in our life as growing up where my mom's faith was displayed, and I remember that. In your life, you've probably got times when your mother or your father lived out that Christian um, that character. And you remember that. And probably played a, 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 um, a part in you accepting Jesus. And so, there are going to be days in your children's life when they're going to remember how you handled a situation as a Christian. And it's going to inspire them. Earlier I said, you know, we're all going to put our families on display. To some, that just brought a cold chill on you when you think you've got to take your kids today to eat lunch somewhere. But you know, the truth is, we're always putting our family on display. Every time we go to the ballpark, every time we walk in these doors, every time we invite someone over our house, we're putting our family on display. Hoping that people see a Christian family that loves God with all of their heart, with all of their strength, with all of their soul. And so every day is the opportunity to allow people to see your family that loves Jesus. So moms and dad, it's not good enough for us just to bring our kids to church. We have to live it out in the home. And that can be one of the hardest places to live it out. Amen? It can be one of the hardest places to live it out. Why? Because that's where we feel the most relaxed. That's usually where most of the stuff comes up. That's usually where most of the problems happen. But we're to live it out inside of our homes, inside of those four walls. Now, is prayer normal in your home? Is Jesus' name used regularly in your home? If you haven't done this, all right, if you're sitting here thinking of Man, I got an F on this one. I got an F on this sermon. I hadn't done any of those things. Last week we talked about do-overs. Start a do-over. Start today. Just be honest, sit down with your kids and say, hey, listen, I love Jesus with everything I got. I choose to love him with everything I've got. And um, from this point forward, I'm going to do better at being the, the example I'm supposed to be. And just being honest. And you just start today. You don't put it off till tomorrow. You don't put it off till, you know, when we get back off vacation. You don't put it off. To, you, you start today. That's step one. How about, how about the easiest way to start is here in a few minutes, you're going to eat lunch. I know y'all are. All right, y'all probably thinking about it, what you're going to eat for lunch. So when you go to lunch, how about step one is pray for the meal. Maybe you've never done that before. You pray for the man. Let me tell you, it's not going to be easy. Let me just go ahead and tell you it's not going to be easy. For whatever reason, that's intimidating. 
And there's a lot of people that don't like to pray in front of their family because they don't think they're praying right. But remember about three weeks ago, we said that, you, that every prayer you pray to God is important. And just be honest with them the way you feel. You, just, you ain't got to have these special big long words. Why don't you pray with your, pray over the meal. That's a good step one. Hey guys, we're going to start different today. Things are going to be different in the lackey home. Things are going to be different here in this home. We're going to pray for our meal today. And listen, dad's going to start, mom's going to start loving God with everything we have. And it's going to change the way we live. And I just want y'all to know that. And then start doing it. So I want to encourage you to do something today that's going to, again, be a little awkward. But I'm going to ask you to do this. If you're serious about, about raising your kids to love Jesus. And listen, can I tell you how important that is? Now listen, let, let's just get real real quick. Our kids in here, they, they understand this. If your kids don't accept Jesus, then they go to hell. Just make sure we're all on the same boat here to understand that. If your kids don't accept Jesus, they go to hell. It's pretty important. Can't think of much more that's more, more important than that. So when I ask you to do this, I'm not asking you so, uh, oh, well, you know, I've got some kind of power over you. I'm asking because your kids' souls could be in the balance. Why don't you just simply have a conversation today when you leave church on the way home or the way to the restaurant and just ask your kids, what's the one thing I could do better as a parent to help you know God more? What's the one thing mom and daddy needs to do better to help you know God more? Then when they answer, you follow through and do what they say. Now, if they say, well, buy me a car, or, you know, obviously. But if they say, read the Bible to me, pray with me at night, do it. There's nothing more important than your kid's salvation. God gave them to you expecting you to lead them to Jesus. So it's important. So when you get that answer, you just follow through. So again, this morning, maybe you're one that says, look, I have dropped the ball, I fumbled it, I have messed up, man, I need a do-over. Good news, you serve a God that'll allow that. And so today, you go to your kids and you say, but now you gotta make it, listen, you need to make the statement that you're starting over. You need to let them know you've messed up. You need to let them know from this day forward. Don't just assume they know it. Remember, go back to the very beginning, you know, you might change, but you need to let the rest of them know what's going on. Today, things are going to change, family. And here's what's going to happen. And here's how we're going to handle stuff. And if they ask why, well, because I want you to one day be in heaven with me and mama. So I'm going to live it in front of you. And when I mess up, I'm going to tell you I messed up. And then I'm going to do right the next time. Look, parenting isn't easy. Nobody ever said it would be. But what an opportunity that God said, I'm going to bless you with these little lives and you get to influence them all the way up until you're no longer on earth. And even past that, we have a huge opportunity and a huge responsibility that comes along with it. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart. We're to teach our kids God's word. We're to model God's word. We're to have symbols and reminders to encourage us on those times when we need them. And so I encourage your mom and dad to, to follow through. Maybe today is the first day that you say the blessing. I talked with a guy not too long ago. I'm about to call it quits. We talked to a guy not too long ago and he said one of the most intimidating things I ever did was the first time I said the blessing for my family. He said, because I'd never prayed out loud. And he's like, it was the most intimidating thing I'd ever done. Now look, that was just Satan messing with him. There is nothing better that you can do for your family than to hear daddy pray than they hear mama pray. Nothing better you can do. Equally the same is when they see mama and daddy live it out. When they see the same mom and daddy in the house, as they see at church, as they see at the ballpark, as they see among friends, 
a consistent life of living and serving Jesus. This morning, if that's a decision that you want to make, that's obviously a personal decision and you have to decide where you're at on that. But I would encourage you that with the opportunity you've been given to follow through, to take Moses' advice and the fact that, listen, if you want your family to strive, if you want them to thrive, if you want them to make it through difficult times, they need to learn to lean on Jesus. And the way they're going to learn that is the way you model it in your life today. Listen, if you act crazy when something bad happens, and you act like the world's coming to an end, guess what they're going to do? They follow the leader. So, model your faith in front of your kids. I'm going to ask you to stand.